We're delighted to welcome Professor Jackie Ramage, who is the Executive Dean for Science at Durham University, for an interview to celebrate International Women's Day as part of our Ustinov Meet series. The theme for International Women's Day this year is Women in Leadership, Achieving an Equal Future in a COVID-19 World, with a tagline, Choose to Challenge. We are pleased to welcome Professor Ramage to speak about her experiences and career to date. So thank you so much for being here today and talking with us as part of our activities for International Women's Day. Could you please tell us a little bit about yourself and your career to date? Cool. Well, uh, I was born in London to a family of Spanish immigrants. So I'm in the blissful situation where my first language is Spanish and my native language is English. And this has been incredibly useful because when I went to university, I worked my way through as an interpreter instead of having to do other jobs to make uh, ends meet. Um, I was the first person in my family ever to go to university. Uh, in fact, my mother finished school when she was 14. My father played hooky from uh, when he was eight, really, working in the fields in Spain. So, so uh, there, there was very little understanding of what university was or how one got there. Um, I went and did mathematics at Warwick University and then did a PhD as well. And then I emigrated to Australia following a man, as one does <laughs> from upon occasion. And so I've spent the last 30 years as an academic in Australia, my uh, entire academic career up until I arrived in Durham in January of 2020 has been in Australia. So I spent 14 years in Newcastle in Australia, ironically enough, um, and then uh, seven years at the University of Wollongong, which is south of Sydney, and then five years at the University of Sydney before coming here as Executive Dean. So I first became a head of school, which is like a, a department, in Wollongong in 2009, uh, when I was still an associate professor and then I became head of department in Sydney and came here to be executive dean. And in all of those cases, I was tapped on the shoulder. I, in other words, I was headhunted in some sense or encouraged to apply by others, um, which I think is telling and I think is quite common, particularly amongst women. Well, just to go off of that, International Women's Day 2021 focuses on women in leadership, which is something you're very familiar with. And the slogan this year is choose to challenge. I was wondering what this means to you personally and professionally. Oh, lots. <laughs> um, so I've, I've always challenged and I do remember somebody saying that uh, if I wasn't careful, I'd be labeled a noisy woman. And this was very, very early on in my career. I'm very proud to be a noisy woman. I do believe that one should be diplomatic. And I guess um, I have the devil's dictionary definition of a diplomat, which is somebody who can tell you to go to hell and make you look forward to the trip. So I think that one has to be able to say things nicely, but unambiguously. And I think it's absolutely vital to be able to do that. I think it is um, often harder for women to do that in the sense that they are often um, labeled as aggressive when others would have been labeled as assertive under such circumstances. But I think we all have to do that. And it's very, very important um, that men do that on behalf of women and that non-minorities do that on behalf of other minorities, because I think the, the work of challenging is so emotionally draining um, that it is a burden on, uh, on those who are affected. And I think it is, it is so helpful if we all support each other. So active bystanding, I think, is key to reducing inequity. And I think that that is part of the challenging that I would recommend. Definitely. I think that's the most important thing. This era of female empowerment is supporting each other. Um, and so I was wondering, other than supporting each other, what is another piece of advice or what was a piece of advice that you were given in your career um, that stayed with you? And what is some advice that you would give to someone who was just about to embark on their academic career? 
So there are three things I would pick up on there. Uh, one is not just women supporting women. So one of the things I've noticed is that in Australia, there is um, a group called Male Champions of Change, which was established for men to support women. And I think, as I said, that that's part of what I would encourage in the challenging. In terms of advice that I was given, uh, not so much advice, but a statement of fact, in a way. Um, at one point, my head of department in Newcastle turned to me and said, because I was the only woman in the department, uh, so that put some context to it. So, and I was constantly being sought after to be on selection committees, particularly by engineering, who had even fewer women than science. Um, and I was told by my head of department that he could no longer protect me which I thought was interesting because I hadn't realized he'd been protecting me. And what he said was that up until that point, people had been asking him if I could do things. And it got to a point where people just asked me directly and bypassed him completely. And so he warned me that I was going to have to learn to manage my own time and my commitments because he could no longer protect me in that sense. He was being bypassed. Um, and that was interesting at all sorts of levels. Firstly, because I hadn't realized that he'd been doing that. He'd been doing that sort of quietly. Um, and secondly, because it, it is very, very true that you have to learn to say no. And that's incredibly difficult. And uh, it took me a long, long time to learn to say no. And I still can't say no. What I have done is I've developed a technique for saying no by saying yes, <laughs> because I can say yes. And so if I'm asked, can you do this? I will say, well, yes, I can do that. I'd love to do that. And I think I could make a contribution there. But say, for example, I'm being asked to be on a selection committee. I can say, but I limit myself to being on so many selection committees per year or per at any given time. And at the moment, I'm already on that number. Um, my commitment to one will, it will finish on such and such a date. And after that time, I'll be happy to take on this responsibility. And so that is a way of framing a response in a supportive way, in a way that engages and that says, I am willing to help, but here's the context in which I am working. And, uh, and usually when I put that context out there for people, they immediately say, oh, oh, yes, that's fine. You know, we didn't realize that you were already doing so many or whatever. They, it, it reframes the situation for them. And that is incredibly useful. In terms of advice that I would give others, I, it, it's not so much that I would give it to individuals, although I would encourage people to learn to say no by saying yes, if, they, if that helps. But it is that what we really need are systemic solutions. So we need solutions that don't depend on an individual being supportive or nice or proactive. It needs to be something that is embedded in our systems. And this will typically involve more work uh, for everybody, but it is well worth the benefits because in the longer term, it reduces work in some sense. So I'll give you a very explicit example. One of the things that I really liked when I came to Durham was the fact that for a number of years, promotions in academic departments have been handled quite differently to the way that they're handled in other institutions. So I was used to situations where people self-nominated for promotion and they submitted their application and that was assessed and so on. What has happened for a number of years at Durham is that the Departmental Progression and Promotion Committee receives everybody's CV from the department and they assess everybody's CV and they decide which of those they want to propose for promotion and they help those people prepare their promotions uh, applications and then um, they give feedback to those who who they're not going to propose explaining why they didn't meet the benchmark so there's very clear benchmarks for people to meet 
and and they get feedback and some people may decide to challenge it or maybe recommended to challenge it in the sense that there may be a benchmark which they don't meet right now but by the time the faculty promotion committee meets they might have met and so the departmental committee may say look you should self-nominate because there is a self-nominating option so that it can that there is a like a, a valve a safety valve if you like and and that system has seen more women be promoted and people who had been been, uh, who had not self-nominated for many, many years be promoted. And so it's achieving those aims and it's a systemic solution. Um, so I think we need to be reaching for systemic solutions. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, and I feel that Durham, you know, has tackled this at least a little bit. I mean, as you know, Durham has four executive deans and this is the first time that these four senior leadership posts have been held by women simultaneously. Um, as executive dean for science, what do you consider to be the key opportunities to enable representation for female colleagues in senior roles? You mean right now in Durham or um, in a broader sense? In a broader sense. Um, so for individual women, well, right now in Durham, we're looking for a vice chancellor. So <laughs> go, go applicants. Um, I think one of the things that the four executive deans currently in situ do is they have a lived experience, which is very valuable. And so there are things that we can say and do at all sorts of levels in all sorts of ways that, that can have an impact. And it's not just us. It's, I mean, we bring a particular perspective, but for example, during the pandemic, when people had to have take-home exams, I pointed out Oh, I was one of the people who pointed out that students at home may not have their own space in which to take those exams. I relied very heavily on the local library, for example, in order to do my work when I was in high school and so um, in secondary school. So, so there are lived experiences that inform our conversations and our decision making and just our very presence makes a difference when when people are thinking of an executive dean and they use the pronoun she uh, that that in itself makes them think about it in a different way so i think there's enormous benefits and we have an opportunity to to bring those lived experiences to the table in a way that is very helpful um, so i i think it's also important uh, to distinguish between opportunity and affirmative action or you know, what, what some people um, consider to be unacceptable affirmative action in the sense that there's always the question of whether you were appointed because you were a woman rather than uh, because of your, your competencies. Um, and of course, uh, it's never an issue, but that imposter syndrome is always there. And I think it's important to be clear on when we are appointing people that we're always appointing them on the basis of their competencies. It's just a question of making sure that those are appropriately assessed and assessed relative to opportunity. Definitely. And this opportunity to be able to denormalize um, these assumptions of, like you said, having a, an executive dean that's a woman and be, being able to use the pronoun she, that is so powerful. And it is so important to be able to also make people aware that, you know, you are qualified to be in the position that you're in and your pronoun is not sort of all that you are. You're just normalizing its use in the position that it's used in. Absolutely. Definitely. Um, and also, you were the director of women at uh, University of Newcastle program? Yeah, that was very early on in my career. So um, it was established the year before I became director. And that was a, a professional development program for women, both academic and professional staff at the University of Newcastle in Australia. So very early on when we were looking at such things. And, and that was eye opening. That was um, it, it's always interesting to to see life through other people's eyes and to be able to provide them with experiences 
that enrich them. So I consider that to be a very valuable part of my development and of the development that Newcastle went through. So they, they still have the program. It's still highly active. Um, and I feel that we did a lot of good. Definitely. And as I was reading your biography and, you know, everything sort of about you online prior to this, it made me very aware that you really are implementing your lived experiences with this program, with everything that you've done so far. You've, you know, come into a traditionally male dominated field and you've made it your own in some way. Um, and I think that's very inspiring. But I was also wondering, what do you consider to be the main challenges that women face in the sciences as it is traditionally a male dominated field? Um, oh gosh, there are so many challenges. Um, and of course, one of the things about making life better for women is that it makes life better for everybody. So the challenges that women faced are faced by many people. Um, for, for some, it's as simple as having to run experiments which require presence at certain times. And if you have other duties to attend to and other commitments, then that can be a challenge and there are compromises required. It can be that um, some people are less likely to be heard in meetings than others. It can be pressure to do certain things or assumptions about the role that you will play in, in that work. Um, and all of these things need to be challenged uh, and need to we need to create an environment which is supportive of everybody and where everybody's needs are understood and met as far as possible so that there, there are many challenges i don't think they're insurmountable i think they are improving but i don't think that it's a pipeline issue so there's lots of discussion about, oh, look, there are women here. And uh, if we just wait five years, they'll work their way through. We've been looking at this for over 20 years and the pipeline is not getting any better. It's still leaky. So there are systemic issues that do need to be um, resolved in terms of um, how to, to enhance the workplace for everybody. I mean, we've got very, very far. Uh, I've worked with people who um, would have had to leave their jobs when they got married, for example, because married women could not be employed at that time. And in fact, I've, been, I've worked with somebody who was so good that they wanted to keep her. So they let her stay on after being married. Um, but then there was an inspector who came and they asked her to take her wedding ring off while the inspector was there because they were worried they might get caught. I mean, this is this is within our, our living memory. You know, these sorts of things have disappeared now, thankfully. Um, and so we really do need to think about how much progress has been made, but there is so much progress still to make. Um, and it's really important that we're always mindful of the needs of others and that their needs and their experiences are different from ours and that that difference is valuable um, because homogeneity leads to med mediocrity. Um, you, if, if people have diverse experiences, then you will get much better outcomes. Although you may get a more challenging environment simply because you are constantly being challenged. And that is a good thing. I admire your, um, you making the difference of saying it's not just about women, it's about everybody and it's about complete diversity. Um, I think that's a great way to advance, you know, the discussions on feminism and women in the workplace, especially into a wider context. Mm -hmm. um, and so, well, the next question is very related. Um, you have held many posts throughout your career and you're now executive dean at Durham. Uh, and so I was wondering, how do you feel your prior roles have prepared you, uh, your lived experience, if you will, for your current role? And any, has anything about your current role surprised you? Oh, yes. Um, so my prior roles, I have been head of school at the University of Sydney, head of the School of Mathematics and Statistics there, and head of the School of Maths and Applied Statistics at Wollongong. And I was um, associate dean of student recruitment while I was at Newcastle, as well as being director of the Women at U of N program. Um, 
and there's there's other things I've done. I've been on the College of Experts for the Australian Research Council, deciding on grants. And I've been on the panel which awards the, the laureate fellowships, which were the highest fellowships in the land in Australia. So there's 17 every year across all disciplines. Um, and, and I chaired that panel one year. And that was perhaps the best preparation for anything <laughs> because uh, I was sitting amongst 15 people of whom I was the youngest and I was the most junior. And uh, and getting that group to work collaboratively, getting everybody to leave their disciplines at the door and to make good decisions is something that I'm really, really proud of having achieved. Um, I think it's fair to say that the committee was less functional the year before I was chair. <laughs> um, so the the experiences have all been very, very different. Um, so Wollongong is a small regional or smaller. It's it's actually bigger than than Durham in terms of student numbers, but but it, in terms of Australia, it's a smaller university and it's an, a regional university with a strong focus on education. Sydney is uh, one of the top universities in Australia in terms of research, and now Durham, of course, has this sense of history and sense of place, which is deeper than any other that I've seen before. So those are the sorts of differences. What is common is being able to work with others and being able to trust others to do their job. So the most important thing in all of those situations has been appointing great people and working with the great people who are already there and trusting them to do their job, giving broad parameters as to what the work should be. Um, in terms of Sydney, one of the things that happened was, well, I, I was the second ever female professor of mathematics at the University of Sydney. Now, it was established in 1815. And the first female professor of mathematics was appointed in 2002. And I was appointed in 2015. And I was the second ever female professor at the University of Sydney in, in mathematics. That's kind of shocking. Still, as I say, so many things that are happening in our lifetime that are still shocking. When I arrived, um, there were five women in the department. And by the time I left, there were 17. And what we did, well, there was some growth in the department uh, during that time. Uh, so that helped. But also when we did hiring, um, I... I looked at the proportion of women in the mathematical sciences in Australia, and I sent a message to the staff in the department saying, okay, there are 29% of the mathematicians across Australia are women. So if we don't have 29% of our applicants being women, that means we don't have an appropriate sample of the sample space. There's language they totally understood. Um, and then I would give them updates as to how many women had applied, what proportion of our applicants were women. And I got people to encourage women to apply, to actually go and call friends or people who they knew that uh, might be good colleagues, regardless of whether they already had jobs or not, and to increase the applicant pool. And then the rest of the process went as normal. We, we selected as normal, we interviewed as normal. And just that single act, of encouraging women to apply was enough to, to generate that difference in outcomes. Um, and that's something that I have brought to Durham and uh, uh, with me. I mean, like, that is part of what I encourage people to do. And, and Durham, to be fair, already did the analysis of data. Uh, but it's sort of done at the, at the time of long listing. So once we get the packs, we get the information about um, what the proportion of females are and other equity groups in, in those areas, as opposed to notifying people what those proportions are early on and trying to get um, engagement and people to apply. And, and this has had some excellent outcomes. So we had a, uh, we've had great results with uh, the number of women applicants and the number of applicants from BAME backgrounds in particular. Um, it's great. There's quite a campaigning aspect to that as well, isn't there? Well, I, I mean, there's always 
um, more people who are not looking for jobs than there are people who are looking for jobs. That's the first thing. And of course, it would be nice for everybody to have jobs, of course. But in terms of what we're aiming to do and to generate, we're aiming to generate an environment which is supportive and collegial and diverse. Um, and yeah, so we need to do something to get that. Um, and it, it is just as simple sometimes as encouraging people to apply because people don't think of themselves as the candidate necessarily. It also helps if you advertise more than one position at once because then that counteracts the, the imposter syndrome a bit. Because if you see one job being advertised, you might think, oh, I don't know if I'll get it. Why should I apply? But if you see five jobs being advertised, you know, oh, well, you know, I might be in the running for that one. And so that helps um, to, to actually negate feelings of the imposter syndrome or offset it. And it also helps because you have a situation where you, you have a chance for dual career couples for example. Definitely. I think by doing this, you also provide such a fantastic example to younger students who are coming in and engaging with um, academic staff and professors to be able to see, you know, either a representation of themselves or just a broader diversity. So on that, I want to ask you if you could speak to yourself at 21 years old, knowing what you know now, what piece of advice would you give yourself? I would say keep at it <laughs> because I was already doing things at 21 years old that, that I uh, have been doing now. Keep at it. You're better than you think you are. Um, but for example, when I was an undergraduate, I was part of the staff student liaison committee and I had one female lecturer and she was on that committee too. And she thought that we had uh, a 50-50 split gender balance, male, female in classes. And I said, well, I don't think we're actually 50% female in the undergraduate cohort, not in first year. And she said, well, when I look out at the class, I see half the class being female. And I went and I checked. We all had individual pigeonholes so we could check. I could actually check the names. And some were not obvious, but by and large, you could tell. And I, I worked out that we were one third female. And so I spoke to her and I said, well, Carolyn, um, I'm not saying you're lying. But all I can say is that at least half the men aren't turning up to class. <laughs> because if you're seeing 50-50 and one third of the class is actually female, then that, yeah, that's one possibility. So, so they are the sorts of conversations I've been having, even as an undergraduate. So um, I, had, I was very, very lucky to have people, even in high school, who were incredibly supportive. And that has has been with me. So for example, I, I wanted to do English A-level and um, the, the head of sixth form didn't believe in mixing sciences and arts. And uh, there were six classes for maths and six classes for English and five of them clashed. So I went to my English teacher and, and I said, Terry, look, I really want to do this, but I don't think I can. If I have to choose between maths and English, I, I'm going to choose the maths. Um, and he looked at me and he said, do you want to do this? And I thought, yes, yes, I want to do this. And then he looked at me and he said, then we'll make it happen. And I thought, oh, my God, you can make things happen. <laughs> and, and that was a total revelation. And that has been as powerful in my career as any of the other things that have happened in university. Because that notion that just because somebody in a position of authority was telling me something didn't mean that that was the end of the story, that actually things could happen. That was, that's been incredibly powerful. Well, thank you so much for talking to us today. And you've given us so much to think about. Um, I know for me personally, you really, touched on a lot of things you know that I can relate to as well so it's been an absolute pleasure to speak with you thank you so much